Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Tonight, I have Robert Grigor. He is a psychotherapist, a speaker, and a celebrity savior. <laughs> you got to tell me about that. <laughs> welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Keisha. Yeah. So guys, my eyes look so tired today because I've been working all day. My allergies are acting up and I have cramps. So that's what it is, right? It is what it is. Oh, are we going there? So before <laughs> the show, I uh, I used these, these uh, cleansing, facial cleansing wipes oh, to uh, just get a little bit of oil on my skin. I thought, oh, this you know, clean up. Literally, I put that on. I think it's cleared up now, but I had a like a huge rash over my forehead, and I was like, "What the heck is it? Um, oh hell no!" Right? Really? I'm like, "Come on, <laughs> an interview." Jeez. Oh my gosh. Well, you can't see it. You look fabulous. So Thanks. let me just tell you, those wipes work, <laughs> and I love Burt's Bees. So shout out to Burt's Bees. <laughs> Sponsor the show, please. Right. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> so. How long have you been a psychotherapist? I have been a psychotherapist for the better part of a decade. Wow. Yeah. Before, before that, I was, a, I was into philosophy. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the philosophy. What were you doing? Were you like a professor? Were you like what? Oh, that's a fun story. Uh, not actually a professor, but I got to actually teach a philosophy class. I was... Um, mentored by a wonderful man, James Cunningham from Ontario, where I went to school for my undergrad. Um, I was so fascinated by existential philosophy in particular, because I was always concerned with why, mm. right? Since I was, you know, a tiny little person that could, you know, say one word, it was why, why right. mommy, why this, why that? So I was so concerned about why. And I was, uh, I spent most of my life, I'm in my late thirties right now. And I spent most of my life, um, feeling incredibly distressed, anxiety, depression, um, traumas. I spent, you know, so much of my life was spent in, in suffering emotionally. And I was, uh, before I even really knew anything about psychology, I was drawn to, why? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I struggling? Why is there, you know, why is there such a thing as suffering versus no suffering? Could there not be a reality where this just doesn't exist and everything is just great? So I was always concerned with the why to, to find a meaning for my own suffering. What happened that put you on the path to psychotherapy? Um, my own struggles was was a big part of it. I, um, I I sort of walked in the back door of into psychology because um, I I started just as as I mentioned I majored in philosophy and I just minored in psychology. So I, I started taking some courses and I kind of liked it. Um, I got along with the professors and. Um, it was again, more interesting for me to find out, see if I could figure out what this struggle is inside of me and understand myself better. I think that most psychotherapists get into the field because we are the ones that are wounded and we wanna heal ourselves. And it just so happens that we can help other people at the same time. Um, so that was, I just sort of stumbled into it. And um, I decided that, you know, my life would feel so much more meaningful for me if I could help other people avoid some of the pain that I was feeling. And I didn't really get particularly into the, the helping part of psychotherapy until I went for my own therapy. I started off in talk therapy um, with a therapist and I spent almost about five years with that therapist. I'm trying to understand me and figure out why I am keep repeating the same problems over and over again. Why do I keep getting into abusive relationships and, you know, getting my heart broke and why can't I find love? What, what is wrong with me? Right. That was the negative belief. Wow. Okay. So tell me what exactly a psychotherapist is. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. I feel like we hear that. We hear, we hear the term a lot, but I don't think a lot of us really know exactly what it is. 
I am ready to, to break down the stigma and change this whole perspective. Um, you know, when people think about psychotherapy, usually what people think about, you can probably see my office, there's some chairs there. Um, you're, you're thinking classically, you think of Freud, right? You think about, you know, the, the patient, it's, they're referred to your patients laying down on this couch and the psychotherapist talking in this particular tone, okay, and how does that make you feel? Right. Um, and, you know, really not really engaging much. And then um, it's so much more than that. You know, if somebody comes to a psychotherapist because they're struggling, they're suffering in some way, and they usually they cannot figure this out on their own. You know, that's, that's generally why people come in is because they're faced with some problem. They feel like they don't have the tools to manage it. Um, they want to. They want a, a, a fresh perspective on a problem uh, that they're dealing with, or you know, they just need help. Plain and simple, I just need some help. Okay. So, first of all, your background is nice. I thought it was a virtual background. No, I'm just kidding, Robert. <laughs> but it looks really good. <laughs> so your office is cute. I like it. Um, so, but two. All right. So when you go to a psychotherapist, you have a problem, you can't figure it out yourself, you want them to solve it for you. So what kind of techniques does a psychotherapist use? There's so many pick the rainbow. There is there is um, there is psychoanalyst, which is classically what Freud was Sigmund Freud, um, where they're, you know, just they're regressing the person back into um, early childhood and trying to understand you know, the, the particular dynamics of what happened in that early childhood, and then using the therapeutic relationship as a, a, re, um, a replay of that dynamic to try to play it out uh, anew with the new, um, you know, the, the therapist becoming that parent or the, you know, the, the angry stepfather or, you know, the absent mother, and then becoming the, the, the full circle now of healing that there's uh, psycho um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which is using essentially um, evidence-based approaches to provide the individual with um, counter evidence as to their particular problems. So think about, and, and often they'll actually join the client in that particular situation. So for example, take the, the fear of flying mm -hmm. where, you know, somebody's afraid of flying. They think oh, the, I'm going to die. The plane's going to crash. And, you know, so then they're not getting on the plane and the therapist will, you know, run through a bunch of scenarios with that person as to, you know, um, what could possibly happen and try to disprove it essentially in the using present day knowledge um, and then potentially even get on a plane with the client and then, you know, ride the plane and then get down and say, see, nothing bad happened. What does that mean for you? And try to give that individual more information to let go of the old belief. Mm -hmm. And then there's other types of therapies like sensory motor therapy. There's, um, there's, there's really a whole bunch of different types of therapies, gestalt, and the type of therapy that I prescribed myself to, and I'm, it's really what I found to have the most benefit for my clients is EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a mouthful. So we just call it EMDR, otherwise <laughs> be here all day. And, <laughs> and what, what that is, is it's going to the depths of where that person's problem first began. And instead of just using the therapeutic relationship as a way to heal, it's, it's partly present there as well, but we're actually going to core memories of maladaptively stored information that happens to somebody when they're in the middle of experiencing a bad event. So um, you know, maybe there really was a car, uh, a plane crash and the person survived. And so that's a traumatic incident, but there also could have been things like maybe when they were little, there was a, a slight car crash, or they heard about, you know, a plane crashing on TV and, you know, they went to their mom and they said, oh my God, our plane's dangerous. Are we going to die? Cause we have a trip coming up. And mom's like, don't worry about that. You don't, and, and you know, dismisses their feelings. So there could be 
a whole bunch of different reasons as to why that person would be feeling that way. But EMDR is an accelerated form of therapy so that instead of spending, you know, two, three, four, five, six, 10, 20 years in therapy, which I've, I have unfortunately had clients that come into me at that point, um, it, we can be done in, you know, months. And the way that I work is a weekend. Right. So, um, EMDR, it's so funny that a while ago I was, um, listening to a podcast and I heard, um, them talking about EMDR and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to do that because I have a fear of water. Ah. Yes. So it's weird because, um, I'm not afraid to get into a swimming pool. Okay. I'm not afraid to, you know, hang out, go on a boat, go whatever. Like I'll do it all. You but... look like you shower. So that's good. <laughs> yes, I shower, <laughs> but don't touch me. Don't try to like push me like, no, no, no. We're not playing mm. those games. Right. Mm -hmm. And I tried to learn how to swim. Um, you know, I took lessons and I noticed that everyone else in the class, they're all like, oh, you know, we don't know how to swim. So the teacher will say, okay, well, I want you guys to just, um, you know, go to the, you know, the edge of the pool and just kind of push off and, you know, just put your hands in like this. They give you the movement and they tell you to just push off and then just come stop right here. Now you can stand in the pool mm -hmm. and everyone is like, okay. And then when it gets to me, I'm like, Mm, no, I I'm not doing that. Mm. <laughs> like, why don't you want to do that? I was like, because like, I, I can't hold on to anything. I'm going to sink. I don't want to do it. Like it's, I, I just can't. Wow. So yeah. So mm. I'm mm. in my own way. I can't like, I've tried it. Like I got to, I got pretty far with one um, teacher where I did it with the floaty and then I was actually doing it without the floaty. But then for some reason, I, I don't know, I got scared. And then I went on a trip and um, we went out on a boat and then they did, oh, everybody, let's go snorkeling. And um, the guy told me, come out, you're fine. Come out, put your, put the vest on, right? And I'll stay with you. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm holding my breath. Right. So I get off the boat and I get, you know, I go into the water and You're so brave. It was like, it, it's uh, the ocean, right? So like, yeah. whatever. it's like, I'm looking around and I, I just started like freaking out. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's like, you're fine. You're fine. You have on the floaty. And I'm like, no, no, take me back to the boat. I can't, I can't like, this is too much. Like, I, you know, oh I gosh, really started yeah. to freak out. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, just look down. It's so pretty. Like, look down. So I had the goggles on and I looked into the water. And if you've ever done snorkeling off of a boat in the middle of nowhere, you see how high you are up mm. compared to how far, right? And there were like these statues underneath because that's what they were showing us. Like there were these statues under the water and, you know, all this stuff or whatever. We were some part of Mexico. I don't remember. Mm. But I was like, oh my God, that made me really realize like, holy crap, like, no, get me back to the boat now. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Awful. So I think that really made me say, okay, you need to have several seats and don't move for a little bit. Right. Yeah. So now I'm freaked out all over again when I think about, you know, and even when we went to, we just went to St. Lucia and my daughter, she can swim. She's taking swimming lessons. She's like, good whatever we went out and this was her first time going snorkeling and then after she wanted to jump off the boat and I happened to pop my head up right when she was about to jump off the boat and I started freaking out like don't do it oh my god don't do it <laughs> right oh. so then she, I'm freaking her out and I don't want to put my fears on onto her mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I feel like I need some intense there yeah oh my god thank you for sharing that yeah, no, um no and it, it's 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 so important to share because these these are the real life situations that people are faced with and and you know you might not know that that's something that you're scared of until you're on that boat and you're like oh my god i can't do this and right. there's no so you know there's there's a part of you that 
is you know logical and rational that you recognize okay so i'm on a flotation device other people are doing it they're fine you know i'm i'm probably like okay um okay and you convince yourself to go down the the ladder just like the guy told you right right and then you get in there and then now you're face to face in your fear yeah and you know it's it's not you know, uh, I'm gonna be okay. And, and, you know, I've, I'm on my life, you, your, your brain is becomes flooded with traumatic material that's causing the, the fear in the first place. Yes. So you're not responding to being, you know, in this situation with the life jacket, your brain, you're like, I'm going to drown, I'm going to die, this yes. is going to be the worst thing ever. And your brain gets into fight, flight, freeze mode, and there's even faint and, and shut down. But that panic mode that you just went in, like, get me the heck back on that boat. Right. You're, you're in flight mode. I, I'm not staying here, which is, which is a, a natural survival response if you were faced with a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I had on a floaty and I was in a floaty, like, you know, the little bubble floaty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll that as well. So that's how you know that, you know, there was something much deeper than that. And right. so if you were to, to, to do something like EMDR, you would find out the negative belief that's that you're feeling in that moment. Like, for example, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And you will follow that as to where that first began, because I guarantee it didn't start on the boat. Right. <laughs> like, that's what I want to know. Like, where did this come from? You know, my parents are from the Caribbean. I remember being on the beach all the time, going to the beach with my sisters. Like, that was something we did all the time on a Sunday, right? So I'm just like, w when did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, is that that's so I'm glad we're going here because it, the, the original trauma piece doesn't have to be related to water. It could have been and likely has something to do with it, but it also could be something very different. It could have been like when you're in the womb, if there was some sort of a, 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 a threatening situation for mom during delivery or pregnancy, and that can be stored within the body and become released at some point in time when you're faced with a stressor, like I'm going to die. Um, or I can't control this or, you know, something like that. And it could have been something totally different, you know, a, a relationship that ended poorly when you thought, oh my God, I'm going to die if I keep doing this or uh, another medical scenario where you're close to getting in, in really deep territory. So your brain thinks in metaphors and pictures and bodily sensations and Right, that's the right side of the brain. And so that's the material that's being activated when you're in the water. Right. That is so crazy and fascinating all at the same damn time. <laughs> <laughs> it really is because it's like, you know, like you want to figure out like, how is this happening to me? And why is this happening to me? How can I fix this? So yeah, I decided like I need to, first I was like, I need to do um like, hypnosis or something right I was like I need to do hypnosis so that I can get rid of this fear and then I can take swimming lessons but then when I read about EMDR I was like oh I'd rather do that mm -hmm. you know because <laughs> then then my crazy side of my brain said don't do hypnosis what if it's a creepy doctor and he does something to you while you're under right that's the side <laughs> of my brain that doesn't want me to get help <laughs> it's like don't do it you're going to drown in the office and he's going to do something. He's going to touch your boobs while you're under. <laughs> like, oh, hell no. Right. Like this ridiculousness. But this is how we talk ourselves out of help or, you know, getting better. Yes. That's the fear response, right? Your, your, our, all of our brains are wired to keep us alive and to survive. And it's, it, even though you know that you're facing, you know, you're feeling, you're suffering, you're struggling, but you will, your brain does not want to face that fear usually. Um, so you'll come up with some reason to avoid it. And that's usually how you know that there's, there's some very, uh, it's post-traumatic material because you are avoiding it, right? I don't want to go anywhere near, you know, the, the, the issue, the trauma, and then your brain will come up with these 
reasons why you should right. stay away. Oh, it, it, the hypnotist is going <laughs> to right. molest me or something like that. Exactly. Or they're going to make, you know, they're going to give me, uh, make me empty the digits of my bank account so they can <laughs> empty it while I'm there. Like, just so you know, I've actually had hypnotherapy done before on me. And um, I never quacked like a duck. I have the recordings <laughs> and uh, nothing dangerous happened. You're actually, there's some similarities with EMDR because what, what hypnosis does is you're, you're relaxing the body so much that you're letting go of the, 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 the tension within the, your mind. Then the, ther the hypnotherapist will give some suggestions for you as to go through that. And in EMDR, there's some similarity where the body will become relaxed as well. Um, both are, you're fully conscious, really. I would say EMDR, you're a lot more conscious than hypnotherapy because you're in such a deep, relaxed state that your eyes are usually closed. But EMDR, you're awake and your eyes are moving. In fact, you might use your eyes for the treatment. So um, you're in control in both. But EMDR, I would say, is you're, you're, you're much more in the driver's seat, I think, of the process, if that makes sense. Yeah. So how long does um, this therapy usually take for most people? That's a difficult question to ask because yeah. everybody's different. Um, back when I used to work in what I call the pay-as-you-go model, where we would come in for you know, a 60-minute session every week or every other week, 90 minutes maybe, and... I would say that my average treatment time for people with mild issues, like I would consider your, your issue to be somewhat minor. Mm -hmm. um, and that, which doesn't discredit it, by the way, there's no so I get pain it. in that, but um, it's a, it, it probably, you know, three to six months of regular everyday treatments for that. And that sort of approach um, it can be faster. It can be um, slower. It right. really depends on the, the number of traumas, that are coded within that neurological system that's responsible for that particular um, phobia of yours right there, which is kind of what it is. It's a phobia of the water. Um, the way that I work now, I've accelerated that. So we just get it done in a weekend because time is, in my opinion, just our most valuable resource. Yeah. Most of my clients, they don't want to be spending even three to six months, but um, it either are you know, effective. Okay. So, um, the, what else was I going to say? <laughs> what is your most, I'm looking at my notes, people. <laughs> <laughs> I like to take notes. What was I going to ask this guy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have my questions. What is the most interesting EMDR case that you have had to date? And I know you have like doctor client privileges, so don't violate anybody's PPP. P H P P P O O P P. No. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Give me two seconds to think about that. I really interested. You know what? Here's that's that's tough too because to me everybody is is unique in their own way, mm -hmm. and they're so interesting for me. Um, I I've had some. Yeah. So there, there's, there, there's been some really interesting um, bodily sensations that have come up like um, and one client that um, would shake uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. And um, once we processed through, you know, where the, uh, the, the emotional aspect of the shaking, suddenly the shaking stopped. And he was able to, you know, function again, finally drive a car and, you know, do his laundry and cook. And these are all wow. things that he could never do before. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's scenarios and think back to my, to some of the, uh, even the beginning cases that I've had where um, I was with uh, one of my clients where we spent two to three years in talk therapy. And, you know, this was, I was just getting my feet wet and in therapy and um, I was providing, I think, you know, really good environment and we would talk and like we enjoyed our, each other's space and um, but still like two years with the same problem is like, 
you know, where's the door? Let me get out of this thing. Right. Right. So, um, I was starting to burn out. He was starting to burn out. So then I learned EMDR and, um, within like three sessions, he says, you know what, Robert, I could probably see my molester in the mall and have a conversation with him. Like, we're not going to be friends, but we could talk. It's like, wow, that's a, that's freaking incredible. Um, another, another really interesting case was this, um, the CEO of a huge, huge company, uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and he comes in, you know, saying, Robert, everybody thinks that I'm a, I'm a jerk. I'm just this total asshole kind of guy. And, um, what's the deal with this? And, you know, we came in and told me, you know, he's the kind of guy that will get in a taxi and, you know, the taxi driver turns left instead of right. And he just will ream into the guy. I'm like, well, how's that affecting your relationships at home, let alone, you know, your business and, you know, think about business transactions, you're at a meeting and somebody says the wrong thing, you're going to blow up. There's the fight response, right? right? So there's, there's all those different responses. And, um, you know, we, we went all the way back to, you know, a molestation experience that he had when he was a, a kid and you know he was like oh i thought that was a good experience um which is how the brain interprets things i'm like well probably i mean you can feel however you want to feel about it um but you know here's the the facts you were you know 12 and she was 22 so you know mm, there's probably not yeah, exactly. So, um, so that, so there's so many different layers that's attached to it. And um, I just, to me, it's, it's, it is like looking into, you know, somebody's greatest essence. I, I look at everybody as a universal being of light, you know, we're all God's creatures. And, you know, to be able to help anybody through that darkness that they're feeling it's like I get to look straight into God. So everybody's amazing. Yeah, that's got to be pretty cool. So what would you say is your superpower? I'd have to say that uh, empathy. Empathy is probably my superpower. It's it's something that, you know, I, I often can see both sides of scenarios and empathize with both person in that situation. And that's usually one of the, you know, the, there's, there's a step where, you know, we can eliminate the distress of what's happening, but, and the person can no longer feel responsible for something or, or no longer be hurting from uh, an experience. But then there's a step past that where you can now empathize with the other person and see both sides themselves. So I, it's, it's so much fun for me to, to get my clients to, to have a fully rounded experience of what their healing is, is actually entailing. Um, so yeah, I'd have to say empathy. Oh, okay. So um, I read this article. I didn't read the whole thing, but um, it said that. <laughs> I won't quiz you. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> It said that in Japan, um, more people were committing suicide than um, dying from COVID, something like that, right? Wow. Yeah. And I was like, OMG. Like, I know that I have, like, over the past couple of years, I think, like, suicide rates have gone way up, even before, mm -hmm. you know, COVID. What what do you think in your opinion, just because you work in, you know, mental health, um, and, and I know there's no one answer, but what, what do you think puts people in that mind space? If you could answer that question, because I know that's a tough question, right? Cause everybody's different. Everybody's going through different things. Everybody has different issues, but what do you think, um, you know, gets people to that helpless, hopeless place? Is it just like mental health issues or a combination of things, life and mental health or, you know, you know, and, and people, his answer is not like, you know, Bible, like, oh, we're going to go with what Robert said. That's why people are killing themselves. Like, no, <laughs> I've got the solution world. <laughs> right. Um. <laughs> it's just an opinion. We're just having a conversation. I just want to hear how he feels about, you know, the suicide rates. A lot of younger people, like, um, 
I feel like when I was growing up, like, you know, we had tough times too, right? But I just feel like we were stronger. My generation, I'm old. I know I don't look old, but I'm old people. I really am. And, <laughs> and um, I just feel like nowadays these kids, they're so young and you hear, oh, the 16 year old killed themselves. Like the other day, literally I was in ShopRite and this guy was talking to another guy and I was air hustling, you know, just listening. <laughs> and he was like, I didn't know what that meant. That's <laughs> yeah, air hustling. <laughs> <laughs> you can borrow it. <laughs> Thanks. I'll do it. So, yeah. So I was just like listening and he was like, oh my God, how are you? And he's like, oh, my niece died. And then the other guy was like, well, how did she die? Oh, she killed herself. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? Like, exactly boundaries first right of all. Like, right exactly that in a private conversation exactly <laughs> like maybe on a podcast <laughs> <laughs> i was just like i couldn't believe he just said it like that but i mean it's it's the it's his reality you know and the guy did ask i mean i probably wouldn't ask how did she die but you know he was just like well because it's it's a young person so you're like what happened Mm -hmm. So, and I just hear these stories so often with these mm -hmm. young people just like killing themselves and it's so heartbreaking and it's crazy. So one, I want to know, what are your thoughts on that whole thing? And mm -hmm. then two, is EMDR something that can help someone who is suicidal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the couple of factors, I think there actually is a, one specific reason why people, um, get to that point. Um, but, you know, to your point about, you know, your childhood, and my childhood, even, um, and this generation's childhood, we didn't have Instagram back then, we didn't yeah. have Facebook, we didn't That's have true. social media. Yeah. So, you know, when you had a bad day at the schoolyard, you could leave it at school, and you talk to maybe your one or two friends on the phone. And then you could have an entire weekend, maybe to, you know, recuperate and leave that at at the at the at school and then return and then face it then so there was a little bit of a gap in terms of how present it was so this is a constant trauma that's being ex experienced for these people mm -hmm. and you think about you know the number of celebrities that have committed suicide yeah. because of their fans or their their trolls that are you know con constantly attacking them and turning them down so it's it's not just teens it's it's anybody can become you know victims of of bullying cyberbullying um and that's just one aspect of it but it really comes down to um you know obviously there is some difficulty in that person's life and what the person how they respond to that difficulty is with the negative belief that they have about themselves because you can look at the bully and you can be like well that person's a bully mm-hmm have a nice day, bully, and leave um, the conversation. Or you can take that, internalize it, and think, hmm, I must be a bad person. I must not be worthy. I must be uh, you know, a shame to my family. And when somebody feels pain to that degree, um, you know, this is going to be something that's, that's attached to a whole lifetime of trauma. You know, it's not just this one day. Um, and I can even tell you about my own experience. I faced suicidal thoughts myself where um, I, I was going through constant um, bad relationships, always looking for love and I could never find somebody to love me. And I thought it was because I was fat and I thought it was because I was, you know, worthless or there was something wrong with me. And to, to carry the weight of those beliefs um, and, you know, the whole history that of my life where you know, right from, you know, four or five, six years old, I started believing those things to carry that through whole life. And then to, to get to a point where um, you're just tired of it. You're the person is just, they think that it's better if they die. And for some people it can actually be, um, a sign of, for their own self to take some power back from where they felt powerless. Mm. Um, I'm not condoning suicide. I do, however, condone um, physician-assisted suicide. I condone 
um, a process that's been been if if somebody decides that they want to kill themselves mm -hmm. and they take a year and they think about it, they go to therapy for it, they talk to their family, they prepare everybody for it and say, look, I'm just not happy with my life and there's no other answer for me but this. Mm -hmm. If everybody is able to receive that consent for that person's decision, because one person's suicide doesn't affect just them. It affects everybody that's around yeah, them. Yeah, and that lasts for a long time because that person is gone. They're at peace or whatever in terms of them living and suffering, but then everybody else is, you know, they have to live, right? And it's a lot for those people, you know, the parents, the siblings, the everybody, friends. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah. It's really a bad thing. Um, it's funny you're talking about this too. There, I, I I just watched, if you can believe it, for the first time, A Star Is Born last night. Have you seen that yes, with Lady that Gaga and Brad, so Bradley good. Cooper? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you, like, you, you you can see. Um, I don't want to spoil it, but um, that theme is in there, and the way that um, the way that somebody takes a situation and makes it about them it's not selfish it's because trauma made them believe that at some point in time they they, they started believing that there's something wrong with me yeah. or i'm a shame or i don't deserve love or i can't be loved or i can't love others like they're these are the negative beliefs that are triggered and when they're so bad you know there's there's been tons of studies out there that show that when somebody experiences something emotionally painful it lights up the same areas of the brain that we we feel physical pain so it's actually real pain in the brain that we're feeling you yeah. just can't see it yeah because um you do hear a lot well i've seen like a lot of people who are suffering from depression and things like that, they, they write, I just want the pain to stop the pain, you know, they talk about this pain. And I'm like, what pain are they talking about? So here right. you are saying that it can feel physical to them. Exactly. So and, and you can't and you know, the, sometimes the response from society or family members meaning well, even they may say, well, just choose to, th to think happy thoughts and just choose to, to, to look at your life differently. Like you, you're so successful or you're so this, you're so pretty, you're so whatever. And, um, you can't just think happy thoughts. You can try it for a while. And, um, for some people that could work, but for the majority of people, it, it goes much deeper because there's actually two lines in your brain. There's two neurological sequences that are responding. One part of you, like back to you on the boat, the, the, the adult rational side of you is like, yeah, everybody else is doing fine. I can probably, sort I'll be okay. I, I got my flotation device. You know, yeah. it's going to be scary, but I can manage it. But then you hop into it and then you're feeling it. Like no, nothing in the world would have made you believe in that moment that you were fine and you weren't going to die. Mm -mm. right no. so nothing in the world you know can except for emdr here here's here's where i go into emdr <laughs> like you asked um except for you know processing through that trauma it doesn't have to be emdr it could be hypnosis it could be another form of, of treatment but um to your question could emdr help absolutely when you work through the original pain and the reason why that person believes that their life doesn't have value that they aren't you know worthy of anything life itself even then that person's entire being transforms and it's phenomenal i, I had a i had a client that came in um who was dealing with um you know she just couldn't sleep yeah, and that's that's what what she came into, and it's usually what happens. Somebody comes in with uh, thinking that you know the problem is one thing, and then we get mm -hmm. into working. And, oh, it's a whole nother thing. So you know, it, it, when we started working, her negative belief about herself was, "I don't deserve life," mm. and so that explains why she was allowing herself to be in abusive relationships, why she wasn't succeeding, even though she's very smart, why she wasn't, you know, X, Y, and Z. And when we went to the depths of where that started from, it went back past her parents, it went into her parents and their parents and, you know, the, the culture of the family system that was passed down, belief systems and how, um, you know, how neglected she felt as a child and some major, major stuff. So 
you can absolutely heal that. And with the right type of EMDR therapist, we can, we can kind of take off the, the, if using the analogy, we could, we can dull the knife right away. You can come in and we can just, you know, cut that thing right off so that um, you're not feeling in danger. Um, so the, you know, we, we use a scale zero to 10, zero being totally neutral, no distress at all. And 10 being the most distressing thing you can possibly imagine. You know, we can take that it's called a subjective units of distress scale that said from a 10 down to, you know, five or zero, even for that moment. And then, you know, ward off a suicide attempt. And this is something that I think, um, a lot of people don't know about that mm -hmm. is available for them, especially you think about the celebrity suicides out there that, you know, um, have access to seemingly unlimited resources and mm -hmm. um, still end up doing something. Right. So yeah, long yeah. story short, EMDR, absolutely. Yeah. So if you're feeling sad, helpless, please look up an EMDR therapist or call Robert. I'll put his info in the show notes. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And you can, you, you know, you can go on to, uh, we'll, we'll link it up. I'll give you the, the, the website, but the EMDR International Association, you just look for a therapist in your area and boom, you'll get one. I'm yeah. happy to answer questions too, of course. You don't do um, Zoom appointments? Robert? Yeah, well, I have to think virtual these days. So yeah, we, yeah. we just follow a ball now back and forth. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I, I need my virtual appointment. Okay. Because I need to make a problem. <laughs> I do. So how do you keep yourself grounded and in tip top shape for your clients? What do you do? Do you do yoga, meditation, drink, smoke? Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> IV drug use. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's not true. No, of um, course not. <laughs> um, I used to I used to drink and dr do drugs, though, but not not IV. Um, <laughs> don't do those things anymore. I've got a child and and I'm happy. Um, so what I, I actually just started getting into it. I, I, I'm into qigong now. I've I've just started doing it for over maybe two months. And I'm, I'm doing it twice a day. I meditate uh, every morning. I try to meditate for 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes I fall asleep and it's like two hours because I wake <laughs> up at 4 a.m. every day. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. That's funny. But I do all kinds of things. I like reading. I, I have my own EMDR therapist. I got to put that out there too, that um, I highly believe that anybody that you get help from should have had the help themselves. And anybody that, that thinks that they have stopped um, growing or, you know, they're at the, they're at the end, they're at the top. That's not the person for you. There's always something more to grow and to learn into. And, you know, please take that into account. Anybody that goes to see an EMDR therapist, or if you're looking like, who should I pick? Cause you, you, you type therapy in Google and you get like, 45,000, you know, hits. It, it's, it's not like they're, well, some places are hurting for a therapist, but get to know that therapist. Ask, what have you been through in your life? Like what, what makes you think that you're qualified to help me? And for EMDR, there's, there's a whole range of, you know, certifications that you can go through. Like you can, there's a, there's the basic training, then there's becoming a certified therapist and approved consultant. And, um, I talk about all that stuff in, in, in a book that I wrote and um, I can always refer people onto that as well. So it's, yeah, there's yeah. lots. I like that you said that though, because I don't think that a lot of people know, just like when you're looking for a job and you think that you're being interviewed and that's where it stops, but you should also be interviewing that place too, to make sure that that's the right fit for you. So I love that you mm -hmm. said that because a lot of people don't think that they have the right to really be like, so how, why should I let you help me? You know, they think it's the other way around. Yeah. Think of it like you're going to buy a new car. Like, um, although the, a car that appreciates instead of depreciates, but like you, you go and you want to test drive this one. You want to try that one a little bit. Like you, you have the right to choose who's going to, this is probably, this is literally one of the most intimate relationships you could possibly have. I don't mean intimate sexually, uh, that should never happen in the therapy room. Right. Um, but you know, this, you're going to go to some emotional places that you've never gone. Sometimes people can't go there with their spouses. You, it might not be appropriate to take a child through there. Like who wants to, to talk about, you know, the time when, when daddy, you know, 
snorted dope and you know wanted to kill himself like that is not appropriate so right. um and and liam if you're gonna hear this later on in your life i'm sorry we'll talk about it <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny so um <laughs> tell us about your book you need therapy what's in that book well um as you can tell it's about therapy um and I think that you need it. No, I think everybody needs it, actually. Um, it's supposed to be tongue in cheek. <laughs> I, I do. Everybody should. Right. Um, and that's really the point. The point is to grab your attention. That's why it's so in your face. Um, it, it goes, it starts right off the very beginning. Like, do you need therapy? What What makes you think you would? You know, and really normalizing the, you know, how many people in the world are suffering? Like, we're talking hundreds of millions of people around the world. And I would, I, I, in the book, I hazard to say that everybody's a trauma survivor and everybody needs therapy. So um, I really think that, and it, it's, it's all about EMDR. You're going to know everything, how it's done, what it's the research behind it, how effective it is, how to pick a therapist, you know, what's going to happen when you meet a therapist and what the process looks like, everything you need to know about therapy. So it's written for somebody that's interested in, in EMDR and therapy in general. And it's also a helpful tool for new EMDR therapists for a refresher course. Nice. All right. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, Jesus, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Like, all right. So um, we talked about therapy, talk about all that stuff. Okay. So now I need you to tell me about your oh hell no moment that you have had. It could be before you became a therapist. It could be during this, you know, career, or it could be something personal, but a moment that has um, changed your perspective on something, or you've learned something from it that you take with you. Like every day you remember that moment where you were like, Oh, hell no. <laughs> I've got so many. Oh, hell. Can I give you more <laughs> than one? I know we, we <laughs> have tons of them, but one that was really significant that you're just like that, that moment made me shift and do this or that moment chain you know what I mean yeah yeah um I I've got a few of them and the one that's popping up in my head right now was um I don't know if you know this about me or, or anybody um or that many people know about it but before being a psychotherapist I was a lead singer in a rock band I also played really the guitar Robert. yeah oh. a man of many many um old hats and so we we were playing around in Vancouver where I'm from and, and we would we'd play we play all the venues. Um, some of them were pretty big. The Railway Club where um, Great Big C and then Tragically Hip, Katie Lang played there. We we play, got to play on that stage. It was really cool. And um, I loved oh, I loved music. I loved playing. And but I was also, you know, that classic kind of rock. I wouldn't say I was a rock star at that point, but I was, I was, I was trying to be a rock star. So I was wearing the leather jackets and, and I was wearing the tight pants and um, I was doing the drinking and I was doing the drugging and all that stuff and um, playing music. And we got approached by uh, a manager of a, of a record label. And um, she said, Hey, I, I like your style, like your music. I think we should, talk about you know signing you and you know seeing what that's all about and so I was you know we were sitting down the four of us and 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 her and um we were I was so excited I was like this is this is it like this is what people dream of they dream of getting the being noticed in the, in the bar singing their song and like I get to be a, a famous musician maybe now this is amazing yes sign me up so I was ready jumping both feet in you know the deep end there's the pun again um back to the water so I was like let's do this my bass player is like yeah let's do it and then the guitarist and the drummer are like mm, I think we're out we're not doing this anymore so I was like oh hell no are you serious <laughs> like you, you, the door is open and you walk away. So in that moment, I was like, oh, hell no. So I, it was a, it was like, it was like your heart and soul just got ripped out of your, out of your body. And I was like, oh, 
I struggled. I struggled so much in the next, you know, year probably. Um, I would, it wasn't like they just quit music. I, they went to play for other bands. So I, and I was being a good friend still, I went to go see them oh playing gosh. at their other and see them happy and, and playing music. And every time it was like, it was like, it was like being broken up with and then going to a party where your, 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 part, your ex-partner is now making out with somebody else and they're right. happy. Like, I'm so happy for <laughs> you. Yeah. Good for you. You oh know, my gosh. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I I remember that night I drank way too much. Um, I hope this, that your show is not for kids, right? Oh, hell no. <laughs> Your hands no. And I, I, I drank so much. Uh, I had to be carried into a taxi and, and driven home. Like it was just so rough. I spent the next two, well, about two years, we got two new band members and we were doing, you know, I even thought, I thought our music was better, but um, there came a point when I recognized that the impact that I was going to have, I wasn't a, I wasn't like, um, I was talented, naturally raw talent. I could sing pretty good, not great, but I could sing pretty, pretty well. And, uh, but I couldn't read a lick of music. So mm. if I were to do that full time and for real, like I've got musician friends and clients that I work with, they work 16 hours a day, 20 hour days, sometimes on their music. Uh, and it's a real, real challenge, a real effort. I didn't think I could reach as many people that way. So I, I hung up the guitar and uh, I donned the, uh, I sat on the couch. So that's, that's what I do now. I just think I can help more people that way. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. So you play the guitar and you were singing a little bit like back up like that. Okay. No, I was, I was, I was the lead. lead? Yeah. That was my, my songs. So why did they leave? Why did they say no? Did you guys ever find out like what was the root of that? Well, you know, at first I was angry, just like you probably imagine you get yeah, broken up for no it. reason. Like you, what a betrayal. Um, but you know, when you think about it, they, I, I've got so much love for that. I don't think that they were, they weren't ready to go in that direction. And, uh, you know, to be, to be, you know, performing at a high level in anything, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, parenting, <laughs> even like whatever it is that you're, that you're doing at a high level, yeah. um, you, you need to be your best self. And, and that's, I think that there is so much that we all had to learn about ourselves. So I, I, I think that it would have been probably a disaster had I actually been given the the golden keys to so to so to speak and right. that was only really step one like the music industry is it's a very difficult industry so See, it would have been a is, lot of work this is how my brain works so now i'm like well why did that happen was that to push you into where you are today had they not made that offer would you have spent like five more years playing in these you know like you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. what, I, that's why, I, that's where my whys come in. Exactly. I would not, I'll tell you, I would not be a therapist. I would not be married to my amazing sweetheart. We would not have our son. Um, so there, there would this, this, what I'm doing now to, to, to deeply impact, you know, my clients and their family legacies and everything mm -hmm. I, that would have never happened. Right. So I'm thankful. Yeah, absolutely. It's just great. That's what I love about this podcast. I really feel like the people that I talk to, right, their lives, you know, happen the way they're supposed to be. And all of our lives happen the way it's supposed to be, even though we don't realize it. So that's what you all have in common is like your lives unfold and take these turns and things happen to push you into your passions and your purposes. So with that segue, which was great, I might have. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Do you feel like you're doing your passion work or purpose work? Um, and if you don't, what do you think that is? And if you do feel like it is, what do you feel like is the part that's like your purpose work? Yeah, I'm definitely doing it right now. Okay. Um, it's, it is, um, 
the how, what I get from my work because it's not just it's not a one way it's just a two way street. My clients transform me. I transform them. It's a it's a very deeply, in my opinion, spiritual connection or relationship. So, um, to what at the greatest level of what I do, I will sweep into a family dynamic and I'll clear all the broken and damaged relationships of the pain from the past, or could have been, you know, affairs in the relationship or something. I'll come in, I'll heal all of that for the the couple. I'll heal, you know, issues with the the kids if there if there is you know issues. It's so multi dimensional in that in that regard. And then, like I said, alluded to earlier, going back into past generations and and actually doing the healing for those, um, you know, grandma or grandpa if there's a story that the person knows about, we hear and we adopt the stories and they become part of us. So you got to heal that as well. So I, I love doing that. And I, I tend to work with people that are high level entrepreneurs or celebrities or people that I view as creative leaders and to be able to transform somebody like that, who then who has an influence of an audience or or a sphere where they're influencing, then the work goes that much further. So I believe that our greatest purpose in our lives are not to live in suffering and and you know, get your nine to five and you know go party on the weekend. Um, it's it's to deeply impact the world, but you can only really do that to your greatest level once the past is no longer holding your future hostage. Mm, Yeah, I definitely agree. That's great. I love that. Yeah, because sometimes I ask people, do you feel like you're work, you know, doing your passion work or purpose work? And they're like, well, kind of, I'm on the right track. So I just wanted to (laughs) give you an out there just in case you felt like I'm on my way, but not fully there. But yeah, I mean, how could this not be? I mean, you're helping people to like live better lives and you know what I mean? Like that's gotta be amazing. Yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I I think, I think to, you know, if the answer wasn't an immediate yes, you know, within two seconds, you're not doing your life's purpose. You know, there's something deeper there for you. Right. Um, But you're right. It it could be on the right track. You're going the right direction. And, you know, I find actually that a lot of people, that you know, they, they might even be in excellent positions. I've had many, many clients that that came to me having done the corporate gig, you know, mm-hmm. high level ex- executive, and um, leaving that very comfortable, you know, multi six figure you know lifestyle, so that they can go on their own as you know a, a holistic practitioner or something right. like that. And like yeah. that's a big leap, and you know, that fuels them with, with joy and creativity and a little bit of fear. Um, but you can clear the fear. You can just go head, headstrong right into your, into your passion. So the, exactly, it, it, it can grow. It can grow. Right. It definitely can. And what I've learned from doing this show also is that we're not just tied to one passion, right? We have many passions and, you know, like you have a passion for music. It's not what you do day to day, but you could still probably fit that into your life somehow, some way, you know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. I feel like that's, that's another thing I learned. It doesn't have to be one thing, but yeah, we're, we're so multidimensional. Everybody is. Yeah. Absolutely. Robert, it was so nice having you on the show. I enjoyed talking to you. I enjoyed talking to you. Or is it over? Oh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So tell everyone where they can um, keep up with you, where they can buy your book and, um, you know, anything else that you want us to know. Yeah, um, everything is is pretty simple. If you uh, if you can go to my website, thecelebritysavior.com, um, I'm actually going through a, a, a rebrand. It was Gregor Counseling, but now Celebrity Savior. Um, I'm on there as Instagram, the Celebrity Savior, and Facebook as well. Um, LinkedIn is just my name, Robert Gregor, and easiest easiest one I think is just the website. So I forgot to ask you about the celebrity thing. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to get you in trouble here, but <laughs> I'm just going to ask you. <laughs> Let me how, speak to my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> how, 
How did you get into working with celebrities? Was it just like one celebrity and then they referred you and then it just went on from there? Or because you were in that big rock band, you know, you... <laughs> No, I actually don't think I met any celebrities when I worked in as a, or as a as a rock band. Um, but uh, I, I I wanted to be the, my own celebrity, but I I wasn't. Let's be real. Although you can actually listen to my music, uh, I've got three songs on my website and uh, a video up there too. So there's just a random page on there in my journey. Um, I'm but to yeah, let me know what you think. <laughs> I will. Um, so it's a it's a funny story. I I started getting known for EMDR and and being one of the go to people in my city, and I was called by a high profile media celebrity, and uh, she's like, "Hey, I heard that you're you do this thing EMDR and it sounds really cool, and I'd like to do it. Um, can you help me with my addiction and you know my I have performance anxiety? If you can believe it, I'm like yeah, sure. You know I'm." everything's game for me. Let's do it. So she comes in and I did the same at that time, the same intake process as I would anybody, just because you're famous doesn't mean that I'm going to treat you any different. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can believe it, she got up three quarters of the way through the first session. She's like, Robert, I don't think you can help me fast enough. And she left. Oh my God. And I'm like, Hmm, great. Okay, so uh, I guess I'm not as good as I thought I was. So let's eat some humble pie here and uh, let's let's be real. Um, so, but it did light a fire under me to work faster. So mm. instead of, you know, saying it's going to take you three months or six months or 10 months, three days. Look at that. She served her purpose. She did, right? Thank right. you. Yeah, she came in to speed you up. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. That's so amazing. I just love it. <laughs> I really do. Well, that's cool. Um, you know, that you get to work with these celebrities. I wonder what happens, um, you know, between like normalville, me and you, and then celebrity, you know, like what, what happens? Like, do you know? <laughs> Well, in what context do you mean? Like, the like you like, know, the fact that she came in and she was like, oh, you can't help me fast enough. Like, I, I, you know, like just the way that they are, it's like they just change. Like, I know they're not like, OK, so like you, like who you are today. Right. Or who you were as a rock guy, rock band lead singer. Right. When you first started, imagine if you would have took the keys. Right. And gotten to the kingdom how you would have changed and maybe who you would have become. And it's like, how does that happen? Like, what, what do you think is the, um, the, the thing that just like makes celebrities like the way they are, like some of them, because not all of them, I'm, I'm sure there are some celebrities that are just, and I'm not saying anything bad about that lady. She served her purpose. Her purpose oh, yeah. was to speed you up. And that's all she was supposed to do. So thank you, Jessica Simpson. I'm just kidding. That wasn't. Her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know how you, if you work with celebrities, I'm sure you know how some of them can be. So I just wonder, like, do you see anything during your treatment that kind of is it is it just the fawning and the yes people that kind of gives them this like, I don't know, distorted view of the world and how they engage with people and react to people like, what do you think that is? Well, there's there's two there's there's two um basic pathways into celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, one is when the celebrity has had to, you know, work their way up, you know, starting from nothing and putting in the the doggy dog hours and, and just really hustling to make it. That's a very different path to celebrity mm -hmm. versus being born into a famous family. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, ha there's, there's, challenges on both sides you know yeah. being born into a famous family am i worthy of the name am i good enough do i stack i mean think about elvis presley's grandson mm. the huge pressure on him to be part be associated with the king himself right, right? and so you, you know i'm not proposing to know everything about him but 
you know, that's, that's, that's one major issue. And so if you're told from a young age that you are royalty, that you are better than, and I'm not saying that's what happened, but right. you get that sense of um, superiority early on. And that just becomes part of your identity mm. versus um, working your way up and, you know, being just, I'm just like everybody else. And I just happen to be famous now. And, you know, here's the thing that I noticed is that celebrities are people, right? They're just people. They and are. even though, you know, they may drive a nicer car um, and, you know, walk on a red carpet versus a gray carpet, you know, it's, they, they've got the same types of emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. Their handcuffs just may be golden, right. but they're still, they're still in prison. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. I don't look at celebrities. Like I'm not one of those people who are like starstruck. Like there are certain people that I like because of certain things they do, you know, performances. I think they're great, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not like one of those people that's like, Oh my God, do you see such, such, Oh my God, I'm going to cry. Like, but no, like, no. And I like to interview everyday people who are, you know, leaving their mark on the world with the fabulous things that they're doing to help others. So that's kind of my lane. And I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, 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 there's, there's like a mask a lot, a lot that, that celebrities sometimes have to have wear to, because of yeah. their labels or their PR. They want them to act right. a certain way. I know. Um, but then there is, there's the celebrities that are, that are really trying to bust the barrier down and be them, their true selves. So right. it's you know, a, I, lot, a lot of yeah. love for them. Yeah. It's, yeah. I know it's all, it's all a lot and we just don't know. It's like, you don't know what people go through. And so we really shouldn't judge because we never know what path, you know, someone's walking. So yeah, you're right. But those people out there who are acting like they're celebrities because they have a certain amount of Instagram followers, like have several seats, please. Okay. <laughs> so Robert, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed you. You are amazing. and You're doing amazing work. And thank you for coming on the Oh Hell No podcast. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And for everybody that's listening, thanks for having me in your, in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That was great, Robert. 